Welcome, dear readers. You are listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are coming to you from our den, which is more popularly known as the Carol Shields Auditorium and located in the forest we affectionately call the Millennium Library. We are, of course, located on Treaty 1 territory and on land that is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. In this episode, we will discuss Fox by Margaret Sweatman. If there is a book you think we should discuss in the future, let us know at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca. I'm Alan Chorney, branch head of the Transcona Library, which did not take part in the 1919 general strike, mostly because it didn't exist. Across from me is... My name is Trevor Lockhart. I'm the branch head at the Louis Riel Library, and Louis Riel was long gone by the 1919 general strike. And next to me is... Hi, I'm Kirsten, and I'm the branch head at the Harvey Smith Library. I'm the local rabble rouser, or pot stirrer. (laughs) And across the table from me is... I'm Margaret Sweatman. I wrote this novel, Fox. Welcome. Uh, We're so so excited. excited. (laughs) A good book can carry me away from an ever-engine old and And you, dear readers, we couldn't do this without you. It's your questions and comments that form the heart of our discussion, so make us laugh or make us cry by emailing us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca or leave a comment on our website wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. Find out if your comments made it on the air by subscribing to Time to Read on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. In a moment, Kirsten will give a more elongated introduction of Margaret Sweatman, and then Trevor will start us off by giving us a brief synopsis of the book. Then on to the discussion, which you can get in on by finding Winnipeg Public Library on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Don't forget to stick around for the end for our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. Kirsten? Okay. So yeah, I usually do a bio of the author of the book, and the author is usually not sitting right across from me, so (laughs) (laughs) I'm a little nervous. But yeah, so may I introduce uh, Margaret Sweatman, born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, educated at the University of Winnipeg, Concordia University, and Simon Fraser University. She has won numerous awards, including the McNally Robinson and the Margaret Lawrence Awards, the Rogers Writers' Trust Award, the Sunburst Award for Canadian Literature of the Fantastic, and the Carol Shields Award. Her grandmother, Constance Newton Sweatman, was a writer of four novels, as well as radio plays and some poetry. Her grandfather, Travers Sweatman, was a Crown lawyer in the Winnipeg General Strike Trials, a member of the Committee of 1000 and president of the Winnipeg Board of Trade in the 1920s. I found, I mean, it's kind of exciting to like look at the SFU archives and I could see the information about your grandmother and the Fawns, I guess her work is mm-hmm. there. Yes. And then to be on the Manitoba Historical Society archives and there's information about numerous members of your family, including, mm-hmm. I think, also an uncle who was a figure skater in the Olympics. In, the Olympics. in, in 36. In 36, oh. that's right. <laughs> that good old year. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, in Berlin. Oh. Nice yeah. place to be. Yeah. 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 Margaret grew up in a house her father bought that his father had built but then lost during the Depression on mm-hmm. Kingsway Avenue in Winnipeg's South End. And so was that Travers Sweatman who yes. had built the house? Yes. And then lost it in the Depression? Yes. I okay. mean, everything sort of went bad for everybody, even lawyers. So right, he, he, right. <laughs> he moved to Toronto and then he died quite suddenly there of a heart attack. Okay. Okay. Thanks for bringing that up back. Well, okay. uh, <laughs> I'm over it. <laughs> you, you have quite a, a, a nice blog on your website, and I read a couple of things um, about living next to um, some communists um, on Kingsway <laughs> Avenue, and yeah. uh, they were 12-year-old communists, I think you said. <laughs> well, 12-year-old communists at the theater school down there. Oh, okay. Yeah, right, but, right. but these communists were driven out of the States in the McCarthy era. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So Margaret teaches creative writing, Canadian literature, uh, this short story, the novel poetry at the University of Winnipeg, 
And I had no idea about this. She performs with the band Broken Songs Band. Mm -hmm. As a songwriter, she won a Genie Award in 2006 for When Winter Time, a song she co-wrote with her husband, Glenn Buer, for the film Seven Times Lucky. Did you know that? I didn't. I didn't know that. <laughs> like, yeah, I know. I like, wow. <laughs> Trevor wasn't nervous before. He's nervous. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Um, in an interview, you have said about your writing, I came to poetry first. I've shied away from pursuing poetry because I've had to spend time on it that I'm unwilling to sacrifice from my need to write novels. Somehow I just need to write novels and short stories when the novels drive me nuts and plays and songs between drafts of novels. Wow. <laughs> and Fox was your debut novel. Yes, it was my yes. first novel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Although you had a chat book. Before yes, that. Yes, yes. Yes. Was that a book of poetry or? It was short of uh, fiction and it was fooling around with some of the sort of economic political satire a little bit that entered Fox, but it was set okay. in, more in the 80s. And, and then I transferred those, that kind of sensibility about money to the 1919 strike. So okay. it was kind of about overly privileged young people. Mm. Which I, I, I think we'll be talking about later <laughs> <laughs> as well. <laughs> So okay. I hope that that was... Yes, yeah. thank you. Yes, yes. Very generous. Yeah, yeah. And so now I have a, a brief synopsis of the novel Fox. Laid over the backdrop of the 1919 Winnipeg general strike, Fox examines the lives of several characters as they face the social upheaval that culminates in the strike. Fox is a postmodern pastiche of newspaper headlines and diary entries, character vignettes, and poems. Its narrative thread is mostly told through four characters, two wealthy cousins and their prospective partners, Mary, who enjoys her pampered lifestyle and is engaged to the socially charming businessman Drinkwater, and Eleanor, who, in spite of her family's wealth, realizes that she has little to call her own. She finds fascination and longs for intellectual intimacy with McDougal, a local bookstore owner who fights for social reform. Pastiche. Good word. <laughs> See, normally Erica does the synopsis, but because she's away, it took two of us to, 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 fill, to fill her <laughs> shoes. Synopsis are hard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Alan wrote it and I <laughs> sort of delivered it. So we all read the correct book, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I was, I was thinking about like how to start this conversation, and I thought maybe a good place to start was would be with what the strike means to everyone here, as most of us were born in Winnipeg and have lived in Winnipeg for a long time. Trevor, you were born in Winnipeg? I was. But Kirsten, you weren't. No, I was born in Winnipeg, okay. but then I didn't stay in Winnipeg, okay. and I okay. but I've returned to Winnipeg okay. 2011, so. Okay, mm -hmm. that's kind of like me as well, <laughs> so any takers on what the strike means to them or i can start yes I, go ahead i mean i guess i it's it's one of those things where i kind of knew it was a thing it's one of those things that you you kind of i don't know is in your blood or you pick up from various places but i didn't know how much of a big deal it was both nationally and internationally um you know i think especially as Canadians kind of downplay Canada or have problems with Canadian identity. I think the same goes for Winnipeg in terms of Winnipeggers downplaying Winnipeg as a, as a major center in, in North America, which is over the past few years, I've kind of come to realize that Winnipeg is a bigger place than I've probably thought it was. And the strike <laughs> was more influential, even though I don't know a lot about it going forward. So... You know, it's an interesting point because, yeah, as Winnipeggers or as Canadians, we sometimes wonder where we fit in in, in the world stage of things. And so mm -hmm. preparing for today, I went on a website that was like great events of 1919 mm -hmm. just to see. And so I looked like around May when the strike was starting. So May 15th, the only thing that this website had was Brooklyn Dodgers score 10 runs and then 13th to beat the Reds. Ten nothing, <laughs> uh, and then interestingly, <laughs> May nineteenth, the Kalud volcano erupts, killing five thousand people. Oh my gosh! And then just six days later, uh, May twenty fifth, Casey Stengel, uh, who was uh, a manager, a baseball manager, releases a sparrow from under his baseball cap. <laughs> and those were the three things that this website had for May. So no mention of the no strike. mention of the no. Strike. But two of them were baseball related, and one was a horrible volcano. <laughs> like so, I, maybe I was just maybe you know consider the source. Maybe it was just not a good website. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, when I was uh, in um, with this book in uh, Germany, in Trier, in Germany, Karl Marx's home, 
And uh, so everyone there knew about the Winnipeg general strike. That was in just after this book came out in the 90s. So it was, and whenever you'd mention it to any of the German scholars who were studying Canadian culture and history and literature, they'd always talk about the strike. Mm -hmm. So it was a major, major deal. Wow. Yeah. I was just in Trier not that long ago, and uh, Mm. there was a a mall called like Mark's Land or something. And I thought, it's a, it's a shopping mall? Oh. <laughs> Contradictions. I know, I couldn't believe it. Uh, he didn't like that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't grow up here in, in Winnipeg, but we would often come and visit. And I mean, I do remember learning about the strike and, uh, you know, going to the museum and learning about it and just trying to kind of envision because you could still then go outside and see buildings old yes. buildings and you could recognize them from the photos that maybe I saw in the museum and that was kind of exciting to me as a kid I remember that sort yes. of yeah making that connection and thinking I could go outside and the, this is where that happened yes. this is where uh, market square yeah, absolutely yes. yeah which is also what I just really loved about reading the book too is that you know you recognize so many yeah. so much of your your home uh, yeah. in this book as well. And the sort of the fabric, our, our, like our, our low um, stone buildings and the centricity of the arrangement of the city, like w- how we are. It's one of the great advantages of Winnipeg is that it's uh, centrifugal. And, and so we are always driven in and out from a center mm-hmm. uh, here. Yeah. It's a, it's a great town yeah. for yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that I thought with the city was the way that the rivers sort of play a role in, yes. in dividing the areas. Like you have the you have yes. uh, Crescent Wood and and River Heights on the south, and then you have you know the North End, and yes. uh, but then how also your imagery of uh, the bridges yeah. uh, in the book and how they like there's a little Stevie on the bridge or or drink waters remembering his father and uh, off uh, bridge, you know yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. so this whole idea of like rivers are transportation uh, ways if you look at them one way, but they're barriers in another way, and so. So depending on how mm-hmm. you look at them, they take on different roles, which I think is a reoccurring theme in Fox, how you can look at something from a bunch of different ways and see different things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we were all struggling with, I don't know if we want to open the yeah, elephant yeah, in yeah. the room, the yeah. fox in the room is <laughs> the title Fox. <laughs> We all were talking about this, right? And we have thoughts, but we thought, my gosh, we're going to have Margaret Sweatman here in the room. Maybe we can. Well, and, what, we talk about and what was it that somebody said to you over the phone? Oh, and isn't uh, and Fox is just such a great title for oh, this book yeah, about was the strike? That, and then we thought, um, <gasps> yeah, someone was saying that Fox is such a great title for a book about a strike. And I'm wondering if I'm missing something in terms <laughs> of um, if there's some technical <laughs> definition or something that, that I don't that I don't know about. But we were talking before that like you can see Fox throughout the book referenced used, yeah referenced yeah. In, in in many many different ways Sir Rodney's referred to as the old Fox and DW is uh, Fox Blonde Foxy looking people are Foxy. looking Foxy I think Mary was referred to Fox like at one point <laughs> yeah I couldn't find that reference but I remember reading it and then like oh yeah and then I couldn't find it again but I thought I think there was mm-hmm. another reference to yeah so, to Mary. so yeah. that so that's uh put through throughout and then uh, again drink water thinks of or sees the fox before he's he's thinking of his father's suicide but i'm just wondering or i guess we were wondering if there's a deeper meaning to the title or something that is referring to specifically that mm-hmm. we're we're missing because well, that spot too where D- drink water sees it it says he sees it before he recognizes it as fox capital a oh, rare, how tricky of me. A rare <laughs> sighting, a rare and a rare event. <laughs> That's right. Yes. So, well, I mean, it, it's interesting because to hear Alan use the word deeper, because I think one of the things that really interests me still, and certainly was driving me at this time when I was writing this book a long time ago, was the depth that you get from collisions of surfaces. So the word darts through the book and mm-hmm. the idea too of a British sport of hunting, you know, and these poor people being hunted down and then the sexual valences of a foxy woman and mm-hmm. so on. So the book is polyvalent and multiple. And so it's always in dialogue with other, con- with its context. Mm-hmm. So that was what was really fascinating to have it kind of a matrix word, a dialogic word. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, right. I, like I love the words like any word like bread, you know, is another word that has so many intersections of meaning. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I just loved how it kind of shifts through. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we were, we were, when we were talking beforehand too, I was saying, well, I don't know, like, you know, fox, like, you know, to deceive. Yes. And yes. so... Like, sl- I, like a sly fox. 
Yeah. And, and, and so, cause wasn't there a, a point where, um, was it drink water and Mary was left in the car, but he got a bunch mm-hmm. of vets and he brought them unknowingly to this, you know, anti strike rally. And, um, mm-hmm. so he tricked them, he deceived them, but then also Eleanor kind of like, she's of a certain class, but she's almost like sort of trick or being sort of having a double kind of sort of trickery to Mary or to her class, even by saying, yes. you know, I'm interested in in this, in what's going on here. Yeah. Um, but still I taking the benefits of her, of her station or her, her class kind of, although she does right. move out. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Change. yeah. yeah. She, and she's also very conscious of, of the fact that, that the wealth isn't hers. Like she, several times she says it's her father's money that she doesn't actually have anything, which I, I think causes her some inner struggle and coming to terms with who she is and, and what's going on around her. Yeah, like the chapbook that was the prelude to this novel is called Private Property. And so that kind of joke of, especially the women who have no property, and yet at the time, your whole identity is purchased, you know, Mm -hmm. your validity, your power, your right to speak and take action was based on property, and they didn't have any. Mm -hmm. And, And then the notion, too, of some like Colette's writing, the idea that the women were always overhearing history. So they were always trying, it was sort of hearsay. Uh, All of the real action was overheard and they were stuck in the other room. Right. Which literally was the way I, even in, you know, a kid born in the fifties was the way we were raised often. eh? You'd, you'd overhear power and, uh, and you were always trying to eavesdrop. Mm. So that's, and whenever I write a, an historical novel, which is, I mean, I'm doing it again, damn it. <laughs> and, uh, and again, I have to dress them as men in a way so that they can mm. go and interact with history with a mm. capital H. And I, I can't remember where I read this, but something about how the book is also unhiding the hidden, and which mm-hmm. just made me think about that too. I mean, those... yeah. Not, not that hit, women were hidden, but they were, you know, and, and so yeah. you're unhiding them. Yes. Um, and I, there was a, a part early on where Eleanor, she sees her future and it's missing. Yeah. And it just a little couple pages before that, Mary sees her future and it is good. <laughs> yeah. And I just thought that was super fascinating too. Mm. Just th- that really, to me, just shows the different approaches that yeah. they have to their and yet life. I, I find Mary... Um, I turned the book into a play and Mary became, all the characters kind of morphed for me because they had to come become more physicalized. And Mary f- became increasingly pathetic to me. I think she's an alcoholic. Okay. And, and I think we'll have a very unhappy, like a hungry life, mm-hmm. a hungry ghost kind of life, mm-hmm. you know, addictions and uh, loneliness and dissatisfaction. That's interesting because there were parts of the novel that really gave me hope for Mary when she when she starts to think about thinking or comes yeah. to realize that she can think and, yeah. and this is the thing and I'm like oh you you go, Way to go little girl. <laughs> and then it just you you know you don't see very far into the future of what her life is like and I you know yeah. it made me wonder like how how does how will things turn out for her and where will she take this skill that she's developing Yeah I, I think it is about the notion that you people can be bought and they actually are and having all that wealth is not necessarily an active um, source of happiness or action mm-hmm. yeah yeah so it's well kind and, of and like reflecting back on that Eleanor saw looked at her future and and saw it was missing and Mary saw hers as good I almost think it it's actually switched around like yes mm-hmm. Mary has something missing yes mm-hmm. Because she, and she sneaks into houses, you know, yeah. of these it's abandoned houses. Like what, she <laughs> takes Walter's pomegranate. Like, she's like, she's there's so much that <laughs> yeah. is she missing. Moves, uh, like Legato, I think there was one line that really stuck out. It's like, she's yeah. like a little, like a fox. Yeah. yeah. Kind of, right. Yeah. 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 She's always but, putting things in her mouth. Yeah. And that, oh my gosh, I love that too. Yeah. <laughs> she's quite I wrote that fixated. down. Yeah. She was always one for putting strange things in her mouth. Yeah. There were just like little sentences like that that really just kind of popped out at me and I thought, oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. There's the idea of so missing much. though is interesting too because of the notion of revolution that you have to go blind into it and you have to make a total reversal and you have to give up the ghost and leap into the missing and, and take and do a real reversal of fortune and reversal of value 
and, and upend yourself. And then the temptation during this period of the social gospel. So when they combined classic 19th century Marxism with Christianity, it was very, very explosive and wonderfully hopeful. Mm -hmm. The language, the millennial social gospel language was just so full of hope. Marx was so, his writing was so funny and satirical and hopeful, um, angrily hopeful. So anyway, that's that thing about missing. <laughs> yeah, well, and then that just made me think about when Eleanor was in the labor church and she was happy. She didn't belong there, but she was happy and she was orphaned at last. Yeah, I think to gain your freedom by lose by leaving home, obviously, mm -hmm. yeah. and losing yourself in order to become yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a leap for her. Yeah, yeah. Don Say, Jordan Wheelie here, local author and writer in residence at the WPL. A book I recently wrote is called Digital Ogichida, if you want to check it out. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast. So one of the things I keep reading about is is that this is a, a postmodern novel. And so I just wanted to bring up that in terms of what people thought about that. Obviously, it's, uh, as Trevor said in the introduction, a pastiche of, of different styles and different voices and different narratives. And I just wondering if people had general feelings about postmodern literature, if they like that kind of style or if it kind of hinders. Can, can, we, can we define postmodern? Uh, like after maybe, modern, <laughs> <laughs> like maybe maybe Margaret, like you could def like def well because it, it is described unless often you as, would like tell him, yeah. uh, No, I would be I would okay. be curious to. Well, it, I've been thinking about it a lot because and for one thing, I teach a I'm going to teach a course again this fall in the Canadian postmodern, and I love its uh, foregrounds its constructedness. So it it is um, looking at language as a mask. And then also a way of kind of determining people's language. So rather than describing language, it's uh, describing our actions, it's creating our actions. So it's foregrounding language and foregrounding the way things are made. So it's a, I find it very exciting in writing because it feels uh, more surprising. Mm -hmm. It's often kind of, I think it's very humane. Uh, it's, it's not pretending that the world isn't, uh, isn't made up of our language. I think it's, it's acknowledging that we construct our world out of language. Yeah, with postmodernism, it's it's one of the the things where it very much acknowledges the structure of of the world in kind of a very self referential way. Yeah, um, and it's one of those things where I feel like I don't know that there's one distinct definition of postmodernism, but it, it it all comes together. And one of the things I I thought was interesting about my interpretation of postmodernism is that to me, I don't know if it was growing up in the era that I did, it almost didn't seem postmodern to me because it seemed that there was like an element of realism or truth that a lot of postmodernism can get satirical or, or self-referential or, or not take itself seriously. I think that's lousy postmodernism. <laughs> I, I think like uh, there's a one of the big theorists in Canada, Linda Hutchin, on the Canadian postmodern kind of as I think reduces it to self referentiality, mm -hmm. which and some of this really lousy writing out of that. Mm. Yeah, um, I don't think it needs to be self referential. I think it's it's actually more uh, comedic often and um, optimistic and taking delight in surfaces and collisions. So it can be quite cubist, like say, well, Gertrude Stein, somebody like that, where th there's a sense of joy in the making up of and making stuff up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know for me, like, I don't think I've ever really read a novel quite like this. And I thought it was a good pick for us after our last episode, because our last episode was all about poetry. It was a special poetry episode. All the poetry. All the poetry. <laughs> like, all the poetry we could fit in in an hour. And, and so, you know, which, which by talking about all these different kinds of poems and poets mm -hmm. and what poetry is, it was by definition, the episode was very fragmentary. And so my brain since then has been very fragmented. And so to come into this book, which to me is not a cohesive you know, straight ahead narrative. It's a fragmented, it was a perfect almost stepping stone 
for me to get back into like like normal books <laughs> because, you know or, i don't mean but you know what i mean like, like because yes. if it, because yes. you know i mean little, little snatches of poetry or 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 what looks like a, a newspaper article mm-hmm. or or you know it changes from the first person to the third person or someone's described almost like from a god's eye view but then they're described by another character and it's, they don't match up you know and and you we had talked earlier about at the very end, there's a, a section that describes illustrations. <laughs> illustrations <laughs> that either I have a copy that's fallen apart, <laughs> but I do not have illustrations in my copy, yet I have a maddeningly six or seven descriptions of photographs that, that don't exist, which just broke my head. <laughs> I know, I actually like flipped through going, did I miss illustrations? <laughs> no, it's illustrations that I must have had in my mind yeah. as yes. I was reading this. Yes, the, abs- <laughs> the absence. I think it's it's um it is another thing about the postmodern is it's a really interested in absence in, in that mis- some sort of mysterious affection for what is not there right right <laughs> right well and then I was sort of also my, maybe stretching a bit with the whole fox devious and not yes. saying that this was devious but you know you know with a list of illustrations like with a historical textbook of a time, you would have a list of illustrations and the work cited and all that. But you're tricking us because this is, this is fiction. There are fictionalized characters in here. Yes. But, oh, but we're reading it like it's a textbook because there's that list of illustrations. I I don't know. I I, I even went deeper because I was like, this book was published in 1991. But if you reverse the 91, it's 1919. Like I was all like, like, (laughs) you know, I I was just all like, I was was like Farrakhan. Like I was was like, I was like into like numerology all of a sudden trying to figure out the code to this. But But it was sort of for me an interest in a mirror imaging and a reversal. So very much. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Because, you know, know, growing up in Crescentwood and knowing that my grandfather, to me, he was on the wrong side, and mm. and I never met him, but um, I think he was a, apparently he was a very very gentle, artistic man, despite his weird politics. So I had to kind of travel over to see, um, uh, understand how he would have been part of a class that was very frightened of the mm. revolution. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, it was, but then the the xenophobia is so familiar now. Mm-hmm. The, the enemy, oh. alien, and importing these sort of global ideas that are coming into a local scene, and people just get violent and frightened. Yeah, the idea of violence, and I guess in strikes and in in the book, I thought was very well is always very interesting to me. You know, in terms of growing up in a, a privileged life where I don't have to experience violence or anything of the sort. And then to, to think about what these people were going through and, and the violence that occurs. Um, like there's the group of women who, who stop the truck driver. Oh my and, gosh. I loved that. Though. And, and <laughs> like rip, yeah. rip his face off. And then you're like, what, wow. where would I have to be in life to have to think that violence of that type was, would be okay or that would, would serve the greater good. When you're faced with that much injustice and to get that, you know, that you have mm-hmm. to answer with rage. Is, yeah. Um, yeah. And there was a description about they didn't realize or they didn't know that the women are actually the most well organized as yeah. they were approaching them and then just filled with this, yeah, the, the guts. Oh, the women are better organized than the press knows. And yeah. they're full of guts and mad anger, which I. Yeah. And they can't feed their kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That yeah. would tend to make you kind of angry. Yeah, that was such a sad scene in the book where there's the nurse who's going around and and helping poor people and she goes and is taking care of the kids who have chicken pox and notices the mother and the child um, in the room and helps the kids and then goes over to the mother and the child and realizes that they've passed away. It was Mm -hmm. such a Mm -hmm. sad, Mm -hmm. sad part of the book to see and just kind of illuminates the hardships that people were facing. And and I guess the still are, yeah, still still are. are. And yeah, the injustices that that exist. Yeah. Look, one of the things that was really fun and uh, mind blowing uh, working towards this book was the research of the original documentation because they had the labor news Mm -hmm. and diaries and so you were looking at uh, the recordings of what the weather was like on that particular day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and then the sort of the, when you strip away the notion of it being in the past and you try to inhabit that moment in time mm-hmm. and you know what the air smells like and, and then you're seeing then the it isn't tragic. It, it's the sort of the shock of the new 
Mm-hmm. Just happened to take this new, just happened to be in 1919. Right, yeah. Yeah, but man, uh, we're, here we are again, you know. Yeah, facing, well, one of the, the questions that we put forward was um, many themes, attitudes, and news headlines expressed in the novel are still relevant today. So which ones really stood out to you reading the book? Well, I mean, the anti-immigration yes. stuff. Yeah. I mean, the divides, the class divides, you know, the fake news, <laughs> you know, the like propaganda, yeah. uh, the propaganda. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a really interesting one. The way that I guess news media is really struggling to evolve, I think partly because it's become very fragmented and, and people are ending up in their own echo chambers of what's happening. And, you know, compared to back in the early 1900s when newspapers were i guess a lot more political than they then bought too like and, yeah, bought by inf- yeah rich bought by influence people. yeah yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. what i really enjoyed reading about and uh, th- this book now and especially cuz we're going through the 100 year anniversary everywhere i looked and every cbc program i listened to was about the general strike and so it was yeah. really interesting cuz then i was getting all of these snippets and something that i heard cuz uh, i can't remember what program it was on but they were talking about the newspapers and especially the winnipeg free press was really sort of i think taken over by um sort of the the thousand citizens thousand group, um, but that the Toronto Star had sent a couple of embedded journalists to sort of come and be in the strike, and that those reportings were a little bit more open and and telling the, the, the real story. And I, I just thought that was really interesting, that idea of the embedded journalist, you know, we certainly hear about now. And, yeah, like yeah. In, a, in a war zone. Or yeah, something. yeah. Well, yeah. and the other cool thing, like from a technical standpoint, is how difficult it was for these journalists to get the stories out, because like the newspapers were shut down and there were like these rogue telegraph operators that were sending messages or like somebody i feel like somebody took a train to like thief river falls or someplace to, just to get the get these dispatches released because you know when you think of it it was it was radio and it was newspaper and mm-hmm. if you know you couldn't get the the news out uh, mm-hmm. then you, you know it was it was totally ripe for misinterpretation or Absolutely. exaggeration or uh downplaying you know and just going back for a second about what aspects of the book then you know sort of rang true for me for now i, I was thinking of the idea that the workers were not necessarily fighting for better wages but for mm-hmm. job security mm-hmm. and just health just and safety health, <laughs> health and safety and also just like the dignity of a living wage and i was just thinking you know the rise of the gig economy now in the last five ten years in our country or in north america that we we see these cycles again where maybe the pay is good but mm-hmm. uh, what kind of job security what kind of dignity do these jobs offer and and you know how, how far have we come in a hundred years you know that maybe the names have changed mm-hmm. but the issues are the same mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. although I, you know i heard recently you know, over this anniversary someone saying summarizing the f- strike failed and and i thought no it didn't mm-hmm. I, I i you know i don't think mm-hmm. it did they did elect people who uh, they strike leaders were elected um municipally mm-hmm. and yeah. provincially and there was the ccf that was born out of there uh, eventually the ndp you know there uh, there was a great shock to people like eleanor you know who had to come to terms with that that, that maybe i am living in a cage and i'd better go out i'd better mm-hmm. go have a look at yeah. what's going mm-hmm. on yeah, it's interesting, like some of those uh, strike leaders, like they won elections in jail. Like yes. they, were, they were running like from Stony Mountain or whatever. And they, yes. they you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Well, that's really Manitoba. Like yeah. when you look at, you know, Riel, you know, it, we, we put people in jail and then we vote for them. <laughs> <laughs> Hang them and then, yeah, and then yeah, make right. statues of them. Yeah. Exactly. Very yeah. erratic. Yeah. We have a very uh, postmodern look at our heroes. Well, I think it is. I think we are. I think Canada is a postmodern country, especially now with truth and reconciliation. Our whole history, we're realizing, was complete malarkey. Mm -hmm. And we're just beginning to name it everything differently. So I think we are realizing that what we were told, the story was a story. And and we'll never know the facts, obviously. But we are really having to completely revise our whole identity. And it's going to be a fractured identity. We're Mm -hmm. never going to come up 
with the yeah. story. See, that's that's one of the things that I think about when I think of postmodernism is the re-examining your history and, and finding that it didn't exist in the way that you thought it existed. So you're kind of constructing this new history. But then I worry about the problem is, are you constructing something real or are you just constructing another fabrication that's going to be re-examined? It's and a I, really I, difficult problem. D- yeah. It's yeah. the Zelig thing. It's freaked yeah. me out with each book. Um, <laughs> like, what, you know, how dare I put a historical characters into fiction. Yeah. Right. So I, that's why I do always try to let them be slightly out of focus or have a, a sense of scissors, tapes and scissors, so that give some um, <laughs> acknowledgement that this is not real. Uh, yeah. 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 Not exactly how it is. Yeah. This is a, this is just another another uh, bit of fabric. Yeah, I, I found it interesting in the way that you had some chapters of characters that just like would appear for one chapter mm-hmm. just to kind of add context or or perspective. And then you never saw them from them again, which really... Sometimes I wanted to hear more. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, well, they were, I was a sort of ventriloquy. I, I would do, I would research the day of the strike and I would look at it, everything. And then I just sort of try and imagine the perspective where I might get the most context contradiction and most action, most conflict, um, most cognitive dissonance out of that particular way of telling those hours of that strike. Right. So then the, they would, I would ask them to drop by and they would, <laughs> they would dictate what I had to see and say. Yeah. Wow. What a, what a process. It was very <laughs> weird. Yeah. Yeah. It was very, very fun. Yeah. So one of the other things that I made me think in this book, and this is maybe making things a little bit lighter or um, not, not so heavy, but um, so McDougal is the a bookstore owner and he wonders what makes a book used. Um, and so as a, as a librarian, I thought this was like a fun question to ponder because can a book ever really be used? Uh, Cause the information is still in there. And and then if it can be in a state that's not used, which would be new, would it be useful? It's almost like the book needs to become used, used. to be put to use. Yes. So. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if no, there's I anything love that. more to say than that. <laughs> well, I know it's sort of like, you know, one of the, one of the things, one of the fun things I like to do is browse used bookstores. Yeah. And you get to see these books that have been owned and loved and read by other people and maybe little things are underlined or marginalia are, mar- marginalia exactly and so to me when i thought of a used book this is something that's been loved and useful to somebody and and is being reused mm-hmm. that's what i thought yeah and in these gaps like w- one of the things that another say of the sources for this was the unofficial books the there was a, a biography of rb russell uh, if i remember correctly and it was written by i think one of his secretaries and uh, i think the secretary was in love with him in a very very decent way mm-hmm. so the it was what she was not able to say was where the story was mm-hmm. so there was this book and i would use it by reading her loving like very honoring love uh, biography of this man that she respected and I would be seeing something that she didn't know that she had written. Wow. So there was the book, mm-hmm. and then there's the book. And, mm-hmm. yeah. and so the book that she thought she'd written was not the book that I was reading. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I was using it, reusing yeah. it, yeah. Uh, repurposing yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. But the lacunae, the gaps, yeah. the mm-hmm. missing stuff. Is there kind of another layer there in the book, the fact that Eleanor keeps a diary in there and, and records some of her thoughts? Is that just another kind of aspect to kind of blur her character? There or to, to make the reader recognize that this is from yeah. her perspective. Well, and, and I think I remember, if I remember it well enough, uh, she likes her pen. Mm-hmm. So there's this sort of problem where it's through the glass darkly. She can't mm-hmm. ever really see the world. It's always kind of um, burnished and mm-hmm. polished. And so she goes to write and she notices her pen. Mm. So you're supposed to look through the pen to what you're writing, but she can't. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of... Um, I think it's a problem for Canadian writers that we don't have a natural culture. We're Mm -hmm. kind of constructed, we're made up, and often full of malarkey and (laughs) real lies. And then we get this, this is the self-consciousness of the 
the beautiful pen. And I, yeah. I've always had beautiful pens. In fact, I've just recently given up on them because, I mean, heck with it, I can't be bothered anymore. But in those days, I always had a gorgeous pen. Wow. We, we've, and it made it so much more fun. Eh? We've had discussions recently around this table about, about pens. Oh, no, about journals, about oh, um, yeah. beautiful journals, yeah. and about how can you write in the journal? And is it worth, you know, is what you have to write, is it worth ruining? Reading. <laughs> while reading or ruining the pages of the journal. <laughs> <laughs> this is a nice journal. You wanted to have yeah. some good, good words in it. Well, yeah. uh, you know, speaking of uh, journals, Eleanor wasn't the only one that was keeping a, a journal in Fox. There was a character called the Canon. <laughs> oh, yeah. And my yeah. only note here is the Canon. What's his deal? <laughs> uh, so speaking about gaps, you know, do we ever yes. do we ever get his name? His name's Albert, maybe at some point, or is that, am I making that up? And and I found his character like I, I want to know more about him because we we didn't know like he, it was almost like he was writing in disguise, but he was always seemed to be on the scene, like he seemed to be the character just like little stevie mm-hmm. but little stevie was just around because he just happened to you know show up at things but but like the canon <laughs> he was like he's he's there by design and but i never really got a sense of his arc you know i just but but again it's probably the case of what isn't there is just as important as what is there maybe i don't know what yeah uh, and he, he was based on a really of it is a very long time ago but a really wonderful book about the First World War by a, um, a, a reverend, a canon of some sort, who was with the boys. And he came home kind of blasted, um, mm. uh, shell-shocked. And so he, he, I did like that kind of perspective of someone who, whose mind was blown. That and totally makes sense. And he's grief-stricken. <laughs> he's just lost yeah. his wife. So he's, he's in bad, bad shape. And yet he's very honorable because he's still trying to see. Yeah, yeah. Even though he's in so much pain, emotional and psychological pain. Oh, man, that really helps. <laughs> I, I liked that guy a lot because he was kind of, he was lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's, yeah. His mind is show up and like, like are we, what are we reading? Like, what's, what's this guy, what's his deal? Exactly. That was yeah. my, that was my he was words. a great guy. Yeah. I, can't, I don't know mm. where that book is now, but he was describing what it was like to be with the boys on the hill mm. you know, during the war. So he knew very, very much. And so he, it, I think a lot of, one of the really interesting things about uh, shell shock or PTSD is that when you come back, you really are angry about capitalism because that's mm-hmm. what took you to the battle. Mm-hmm. So he had a very, very physical fury at what had brought on that war. And I thought it was interesting too, like like the the word play with canon and canon, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. the, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, there's like layers. There's layers I know. Yeah. I really, I, I really <laughs> feel like we could like really dissect so much yeah. of this. But I did want to ask why Eleanor and Mary, like why, or why those four characters, why did you choose? Because like there were some really large female characters that you do bring in, um, like Helen Armstrong and, mm-hmm. and even some of the Eaton's workers. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and her yeah. Sister. Um, yeah. so mm-hmm. I was just wondering, um, why Eleanor and Mary? I guess it was because of where I grew up. I did leave home as, you know, at 17 or something and never had any money of my own. Just like Eleanor, <laughs> right. but, but I was, uh, growing up, I was really aware of a problem with my class that if I didn't get out of my class, I would never be able to write. Mm. And so I wanted to write about that. About I was terribly uncomfortable with what I could see could have been my fate if I didn't leave home, was that I would die of comfort. And oh, wow. so I, I was very interested in women who might be destroyed by money and uh, cannot become artists or writers or anything like that, or, or even functioning, useful people, because they're too busy playing golf and trying on clothes and... So, and, and also I think I liked the idea of the contradiction that I'm going to write about poverty from the perspective of the wealthy. Mm-hmm. And, and they're trying to hear, you know, and they money is so cruel. So the, I was interested in the perspective of cruelty where you've got a Mary and she says at one point, like, what is that smell? You know, and, and it's a poverty and, um, oh, that smells terrible. And it's poverty. And that, the fact that a human being can say that is exciting and terrifying and there's a lot of, again, as I say, action in that dissonance. Mm-hmm. You know, there, she's a very, very cruel young woman, mm-hmm. Mary. Mm-hmm. And, and yet she would never, ever think that she is. No. But there's a cruelty in her perspective, in her, in her perception. So I was very interested in that. And Eleanor is cruel as well. She can't help it. Right. You know, Eileen recognizes, I don't know if it's in the play or in the novel, I've forgotten. <laughs> Eileen calls Eleanor, you know, you are, you are cruel. Mm. And Eleanor goes, 
you're right. I, yes, I am. I am. I am implicitly cruel because mm-hmm. of my class. That is my essential self is cruel. Wow. Yeah. Okay. But, I really want. I really want to see the play, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even just read the play. Yeah, like, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. That kind of reminds me of the conversation that we're having about things that are, that are happening today, and, and in terms of rich people and and things like inter uh, Instagram. Um, or taste makers, or you know, who, influencers. 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 influencers, influencers. Yes, get the <laughs> uh, the words right. But yeah, that there's people, and then it, their whole lives is just to be rich and on camera. And then I, I wonder if they know where they begin and they end um, in, in terms of society. Yes, and, yeah. And you get kind of caught up in a narcissism that is actually a prison, a mm-hmm. very comfortable prison. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's almost the worst kind of prison. You could you could argue that yeah. a, a comfortable prison that you just wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Since we're on the topic of writing, I guess a little bit, we did have one person write in via Instagram. Um, so Instagram can have good purposes. <laughs> is, this, is this an influencer that has written? <laughs> Not an influencer. It was an influencer as, that posted the question. As, oh, and sure. yeah. Classic. Uh, but uh, Sin Doyle asks, how does teaching creative writing influence your own writing, if at all? And how has your writing process changed over the years? It hasn't changed very much. Teaching is quite different. I'm very lucky to have my job for an income, but also Mm -hmm. because I get to talk about what I love for a few months of each year. But it is a different... I'm always trying to let students Mm -hmm. feel confident and not let them know that it's awful, (laughs) that it's very, very difficult to write. That's what sort of bothers me about it, because I'm, I mean, really, if they're going to engage with writing, they're going to have to just go home and stop taking classes, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and actually face themselves in that silence. So it's a bit of a, that's what kind of bothers me about teaching, because it's a little bit false that way, because you're, mm-hmm. you're trying to make people comfortable, and writing isn't comfortable. <laughs> um, and then the process is really still the same. I devour as much primary source and secondary source. I do a lot of research, and then I try and metabolize it and, and live it until the book can start talking to me. Uh, so you try and cook the research material till it blends into into the soup, you know, and, mm-hmm. the, and then you try and forget about all the research and just simply inhabit it. So yeah. it's the same thing. Yeah. I think I've been the same person since I was six. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little tired of it. Cooking up that, that, yeah. that soup. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Awesome. That's a lovely question. Yeah. Do you have unlimited financial reserves? Do you enjoy spending significant amounts of money on products that are unsafe? Are you satisfied with products that fail to deliver on their promises? Me neither. I like to do some research when I have to spend my money, but it can be hard to find a good source of reviews sometimes. While many websites carry product reviews, the reviews are often incomplete and occasionally look like they might have been written by someone who works for the product's marketing department. One useful source for product reviews is Consumer Reports. Founded in 1936, Consumer Reports is funded completely through subscriptions and grants. They don't accept any money from product manufacturers, so they're less likely to be biased by financial incentives. Their staff test and analyze products, conduct investigative journalism, and advocate for consumers in the legislative arena. Winnipeg Public Library carries a number of Consumer Reports publications in our branches and offers access to consumerreports.org through our website. On ConsumerReports.org, you have access to all of their published reviews, videos, blogs, and forums. Whether you're buying a car, a dishwasher, headphones, or a mattress, Consumer Reports reviews are a great way to get solid information and make an informed purchasing decision. To access ConsumerReports.org, go to our website, winnipeg.ca slash library, click on the Databases button, then click on Consumer Reports. So it's uh, time to segue into our most awkwardly worded uh, segment. Uh, Can you tell me a book you would also like? So this is where we give a book recommendation based on Fox of of something that we think you would also like or any sort of book recommendation. Anyone want to start us off? I'm happy to go with sure. it. Sure. Yeah. So um, the book that I picked was called, and I brought a, a prop, even though this is a podcast and non-visual <laughs> media, I tend to do that, The Given Day by Dennis Lehane. Now, Dennis Lehane is an American, mostly crime uh, writer in the sense that he has a detective series and it's really great. But then he he's done little forays into historical fiction. 
And so The Given Day takes place in Boston in 1919, same year as Fox, about a Boston police strike. And it also talks about very similar issues in Fox, uh, economic disparity, uh, racism. uh, And uh, it's not a postmodern novel in the sense uh, that it is more of a straight ahead narrative. But if you don't want to read the entire book, I really recommend reading the first 30 pages or so, because (laughs) the first 30 pages could be a short story in itself. Because what it is, is it's the opening scene is in the fall in 1918, and uh, it's the Cubs versus the Red Sox in the World Series. And in those days, they would travel by train between the cities. So they had played two games in Chicago, and they were on their way back to Boston, and the train breaks down in rural Ohio. And uh, Babe Ruth, who's on the plane, train, gets off and kind of walks around, and he happens upon a group of black athletes playing baseball, which at this time, of course, black athletes were forbidden from playing Major League Baseball. It wasn't until 1947, Jackie Robinson. So this opening scene is Babe Ruth stumbling upon these really good players, and then one by one, all these other famous players leave the train and come to the, this uh, ballpark, and then it's sort of like, well, let's, let's see who's best. Mm. And, and it comes down to this game and it's pretty interesting I'm not going to say what happens but uh, the first 30 pages of the book is uh, worth a read if you don't want to read the whole thing Wonderful. The Given Day Dennis wow. Lehane well, Wow Yeah Baseball is a common theme with, with <laughs> yes, guy. I see yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Casey Stengel's sparrow appeared under his hat <laughs> Did you have a book, Margaret? Well, I have a writer, um, and um, Deborah Levy, if you guys ever... She's British. Uh, One of her novels, the favorite novel of mine is called Swimming Home. She's a British writer. Um, I think it's Hot Milk that was nominated for the Booker. Mm -hmm. Um, And she's a... And this, uh, and I did bring, just because I had it in front of me, Mm -hmm. Things I Don't Want to Know a living autobiography, Deborah Levy, L-E-V-Y. I love all her work. And she also writes crazy plays, very, very political. She inhabits uh, politics and the vividness of being alive in a really integrated cinematic way. She's Hmm. very fun to read, full of light, uh, um, like sunlight. So there's this sense of sort of the phenomena of experience. She's, I I just, I I adore her work. Fabulous. We awesome. have a bunch of show notes at the end of our podcast, so we will have links to all of, all okay, of these thanks. suggestions. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, so I don't have a book to recommend. I have an album. As I was reading Fox, this one particular song kept uh, popping into my head. You're, you're changing. Yeah. Are we allowed to bring in songs? No. Okay, all right, <laughs> next time. <laughs> uh, so so the album is, uh, is by Nico Case, and mm-hmm. the album appropriately is called Fox Confessor Brings mm-hmm. the Flood, um, and the track is Margaret versus Pauline. So it's a song that contrasts the life of two women, uh, one wealthy and one working class, wow. which reminded me of Mary and Eileen um, in Fox. Eleanor, yeah. No, no. Oh, and Eileen. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, Fox, the, the yeah, one the who had the $5. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Got it. <laughs> but so, yeah, so I just, it was going to read a verse. So it's, um, two girls ride the blue line, two girls walk down the same street. One left her sweater sitting on the train. The other lost three fingers at the cannery. Everything's so easy for Pauline. And it's such a hauntingly, hauntingly beautiful wow. song. Very concise, but yes. speaks, speaks volumes. Lucid, yeah. yeah. Love Nico Case. <laughs> yeah. I think I mentioned at the beginning what I also really loved about reading this and being someone who has lived here in this city for seven years now. I did love that I could, I live in Arlington, so I I loved being able to read about the characters Mm -hmm. going down Arlington or talking about the river and just being able to have that, have that image, that Mm -hmm in my mind. Um, And so there was another book that I read many, many, many years ago that I had the same type of feeling about Winnipeg. And that was Republic of Love by um, Carol Shields. And it is a love story. But what really stuck with me when I read it 20 years ago, or whatever it was, was Winnipeg and uh, the description of Winnipeg, but also the description of the interconnectedness of everyone within Winnipeg, because these two people, um, they don't actually even really meet until halfway through the novel. But there's all this interconnectedness of other families and friends, and they should probably have met beforehand, but they don't meet till halfway through. And um, and she's a folklorist who studies mermaids. And I, I, it was just quite 
delightful. And I've always remembered it. I only read it once, and but I always just have such a good, happy memory of it and and, and about uh, Winnipeg. So I don't know if it would have, will stand the test of time for me rereading it, but at that time, and I almost don't even want to reread it because it just, <laughs> it's in my memory as being this very, very yeah influential book for me. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it can always be very disappointing once you've read something and it's built up in your memory a certain way and then you you reread it and you're like this is good but it's not the same yeah as it used especially to. love stories when you yeah. read them like when you were 20 <laughs> and now you're rereading them and you're like oh <laughs> that's a bit of crap yeah uh, so now it's time for everyone's favorite segment nerd words for word nerds uh the part of each show where each host boils down their most prevalent thoughts of the past month into one word so kirsten since you went last for that one do you want to go first for um, or am i putting you on the spot I just, I had something (laughs) here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So my nerd word is carceral. (laughs) That's not your nerd word, is it, it, Trevor? No. Okay, good. I think of the email exchange we had yesterday. No, I know. I know. Is that why you picked it or? Well, that's one of the reasons. And then somebody else that I was talking to um, also was like, carceral? What is, like, they thought I was saying the wrong word. Anyway, I just did a a presentation um, today. I was on a panel at the U of W, actually. It was an information literacy um, conference. And I was part of a panel called Instruct and Deconstruct Information Literacy Within Carceral Institutions. And so that was word has been rolling off my tongue. It's from the Latin carcialis of relating to suggesting a jail or prison. So what I was also thinking about with this word is I remember seeing this photo. And again, I'm holding a photograph for our audio (laughs) audience. And it's a photograph of the strikers who were released from Stony Mountain, but only those without a Z in their name were released. And so prison is often on my mind, but uh, this picture also really struck me as well. And that sentence about anyone uh, with a Z didn't make bail because um, in preparing for my presentation, I was just reading some statistics. Uh, for statistics Canada reported um, last this month that Manitoba has the highest incarceration rate in Canada, 231 adults per 100,000 population. Oh God. The average provincial and territorial rate is 80 three adults per 100,000 population, and about three quarters of all Manitoba inmates are Indigenous peoples. So horrifying, horrifying, horrifying. So I was sort of making a little bit of connection with the book. Um, But yeah, carceral has been very much on my mind this month, but all of the months, frankly, (laughs) carceral. Uh, That's a tough act to follow. uh, (laughs) My my word is Sora, S-O-R-A. And the reason I picked this word is uh, last week I did a thing where I went very early to Fort White, 7 a.m. in fact, to join a group of bird watchers oh. because it, with the spring migration, they, you, you know, a special event, you can go early before the place actually opens and you're mm-hmm. teamed up with an actual person that knows about birds and they walk you around and you look for birds. Oh, cool. and it was great because yeah. I don't know anything about birds. <laughs> and so the most exciting bird that I saw was called a Sora. Oh. S-O-R-A. I had never heard of it before. I have a picture here. Um, <laughs> again, this is for our Platinum membership. That, that they'll get the uh, video feed of this. Uh, you can see Look this is that. what... this is what. Uh, yeah, it's got a bright yellow beak. And it's also called the meadow chicken. And the thing is, it's one of the most prevalent birds in North America. But what? no one ever sees it because it's so secretive. <laughs> It it's around like a fox, <laughs> yeah, like a fox. <laughs> the thing is, like, so we we stumbled upon it, and it was just doing its thing uh, on the shore, you know, and and I, I just felt this real, you know, kinship to Aww. this little Sora doing its thing, not caring, you know, and then and then it just went back into the reeds, and, and I thought, you know, I'm going to go home. I have a book called Manitoba Birds, and I was like, for sure, this bird's not going to be in there because, <laughs> like, I've never heard of it. I flipped through. It's there. It's in the book. So not only is it good at hiding in the reeds, it's good at hiding in my Manitoba Birds book because I've had this book for 15 years and it's not that big of a book. The Sora wow. is in yeah. there. And uh, I, just, I just thought, isn't that great? Because you, know, you see something new. Mm-hmm. You, how often do you see something absolutely new? And I saw that not and often. I thought, Sora. Aww. Yeah. There he is. I'm putting him away. <laughs> 
Uh, so for my word, uh, I picked a neutral. Um, so every once in a while, I like to sneak a little bit of library discussion into the podcast. So neutral is defined as having no personal preference or bias or having no opinion, among other things. There are other definitions. That sounds like me. <laughs> Very neutral. <laughs> well, in the library world, there's often been the perception or misperception that libraries uh, are a neutral place. Recently, this has been, you know, there's been discussions about challenging this in two ways. Uh, one, should libraries be neutral is a question. And two, have libraries ever really been neutral to begin with? Both are very heavy questions and both are being considered in other areas of society. Can judges be a neutral party? So neutrality has been on my mind because I've been listening to Michael Lewis's new podcast, Against the Rules. And it's one in which he critically examines the way society tries to implement fairness through the use of referees or a neutral party. It's interesting because the first episode examines how NBA referees are measurably more fair than they have ever been in in terms of officiating the game. But paradoxically, they're hated more than ever. So the more fair things get, the more things are hated. Mm. Um, So he uses this as as a jumping off point to examine how changes in perception of neutrality affect things like the financial markets, newsrooms, the English language and the U.S. legal system. And so it, it kind of makes me wonder if the idea that anyone can be neutral is is, is kind of a fallacy, but I, I, it makes me wonder if the idea of neutrality is like the idea of a good in that there are some circumstances where you want to be striving towards it, even though that you'll, you know you'll never be able to achieve it and, and how, how you think about neutrality that way. So that's kind of been mm, on really my mind. really interesting. And yeah. Canada is always supposed to be so neutral. Right. right? Yeah. It's a good mask. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So yeah. It's really interesting. Well, I hope there's some, maybe there's some intersection, except maybe without Sora. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I was thinking of the word sedition oh. and seditious from this book. Yes. Because, and I, what a weird word, because whoever is using the word is the one who has the power. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if, you know, it's like they're their dad, they're their father, and they can call whatever you're doing seditious. And you may end up uh, being charged with terrorism, for that matter, now. So, and certainly it was in this word, they would, you know, that you are inciting. Uh, I, think in, I think in Fox, I found yeah. it's a hot word in a dry place. Yes, yes. So, so whatever, it, it, to be seditious, you have to be successful. <laughs> or, or then you know, you, you, no one's noticed you. So right. it's a, it's a full of all these weird convolutions of power, even just to inflict the word on somebody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, good one. Oh, did yeah. you have something, Trevor? No, not no, at all. I was just uh, <laughs> taking it in. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, uh, we have to sign off for this month. A big thanks to Margaret Sweatman for joining us on thank this you recording. So thank much. you for having me. No, it's it's really fun to talk with you guys. <laughs> And thank you so much, dear readers, for tuning in to this, our 17th episode of Time to Read. In April, join us as we will be reading Trickster Drift by Eden Robinson, a sequel to Son of a Trickster, which you may remember we discussed way back in episode seven, like 10 episodes ago. So joining us for this recording will be special guest and former Winnipeg Public Library writer-in-residence Jordan Wheeler, uh, which I should also mention, Kirsten, you somehow missed this in your bio of Margaret Sweatman. You were were, uh, a writer in residence at Winnipeg, I, I was Pop- here. At uh, Winnipeg yeah, Public Library yeah. at one point. Yeah, I think so, 06 or thereabouts, yeah. yeah. Another thing I should say about Kirsten's biography is she almost <laughs> always invites the oh, author you know over to her place for, for supper. <laughs> but of course, we never actually have the author here. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Margaret, I you're I think I could you're totally to have Margaret over. Sweatman <laughs> over for dinner. I would totally, especially after this discussion, it's been so great. I would totally have you over for dinner. It would be fun. Uh, so, yeah, so before next episode don't forget to reach out to us ahead of time so you can let us know if you thought the sequel was better than the original uh find us uh on facebook or by emailing us at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca uh we'd love it if you hit subscribe in itunes or your favorite podcast service uh we'd love it even more if you were to give us a five-star rating and until next time make sure you find time time to to read Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Time to Read podcast. We were talking about Fox by Margaret Sweatman. Time to Read is a production of the Winnipeg Public Library. Our panel today included Trevor Lockhart, Alan Chorney, Kirsten Werman, and special guest Margaret Sweatman, author of the book we were reading. Erica was away for this episode, but will rejoin us. 
Our webmaster is Aaron Seaburn. Our social media guru is Regan Brew. Audio production and music by Dennis Penner. Special thanks to Turnstone Press, publisher of Fox and other fine books. You can be part of the show too. Email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca with suggestions for books that you'd like us to read and discuss and comments and questions about the book we're reading for our next show. Visit us on the web at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. Check out our show notes with links to some of the things we talked about today and take part in a discussion about the books we're reading. You can also join our Facebook group. Next month, we're reading Trickster Drift by Eden Robinson, and we'll have special guest Jordan Wheeler with us to discuss it. We're looking forward to hearing what you think about it. You guys, you did so much. Thank you so oh, much for so having This was like I, a first for us. I know, and I think we were all a little bit nervous. <laughs>